All right, excellent. <laughs> hey, Maria. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yeah, super excited to be here today. Um, I, since we have a packed schedule, Ben, unless you mind, I'm going to start kicking us off with just introducing ourselves really quick um, and the webinar and the forum and what we're up to so that uh, we can use the time more efficiently. That's all right with you. Um, so, uh, hello, Jeanette. Uh, welcome. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, wherever you are. And very, very welcome to um, our uh, first webinar of 2022. So first of all, happy, very happy new year um, to, to everyone. Uh, and today we have a special webinar, something that I have been bugging Ben to do for a year. Uh, and I'm so thrilled that he is finally today taking on this um, topic of gravity modeling tips and traps for pr practitioners. So if you don't know Ben other than from the forum, uh, you will be thrilled when you look at his LinkedIn profile and all the amazing work that he's done. He is one of the few people I know who is uh, a great modeler, academic, as well as practitioner and policy, um, policy virtuoso is what I would call him, um, because he knows it all. And so, uh, not only did he actually come and do this webinar that I've been bugging him about, but he wrote up his, an amazing booklet. And if you haven't checked it out, please do head over to the TPR Forum website. The booklet is available there. Um, we are kicking off this new year with a couple of really great improvements, one of which is Sylvia Soresco, who today is our panelist or discussant but she um, is also uh, going to join us and work a little bit more with us as well as um, Jeffrey. Uh, so uh, welcome especially to them. And if you look over at the new website or at the website, you will see some new updates there. Uh, you will see that we have a new tab that's called resources. And under resources, you can find Ben's booklet. Uh, and there's also a by popular demand, a donate button. So um, Ben and I do all of this on our free time, but we also pay to play. So we're paying for having the forum uh, up and running. Uh, and so in case you find the forum useful or the booklet useful, uh, please consider donating. We've made it very easy. There's just a button to click and you can donate through PayPal. So that's one thing. Uh, and the other thing is that there's another tab that we call forum. And the forum is a place where we can continue. Uh, TPRforum.org um, uh, is, is the address, Amra. Uh, and there's a tab there called um, the forum too, where there's a little blog post about today. And then we can continue the conversations there uh, under comments. And so Ben and Sylvia will check in and uh, so and see if they can answer these questions after the webinar as well, so that we have a place to continue the conversation. Uh, we also have some really exciting news um, that we will share as we go. Um, some really exciting webinars uh, and other interesting things that are coming up and we'll be talking more about them in February. Um, uh, so I think that's all, all the introduction I'm going to do today, Ben. And if you're interested in the forum, uh, there's more information about that on the website. We usually do a little play on that, but yeah, we have just too much awesomeness here today. Spend time on that. Um, so without further ado, uh, Ben. Okay, thanks, Hannah. Let me just get my slides up. Um, so when Hannah says that she was bugging me to do this, I would say motivating me. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's an important distinction. Um, but what we're trying to do, and that's actually the wrong screen for me. Here we go. Um, okay, so what we're going to do in this session, um, you know, I've called this tips and traps for practitioners. And 
what I'm really going to be doing is talking to you about some of the stuff that I've learned uh, doing gravity modeling. Um, when, when Sylvia, who also does this, uh, and I were talking offline just before starting, we, we basically agreed that uh, a lot of the stuff that we've learned, we've learned the hard way. That, that is to say, making mistakes and then having some nice person kind of point it out. So the objective of the booklet and the objective of the talk is to try and help you pass uh, some of those issues and to get to uh, what I think is sort of a good cut of uh, current best practice in gravity modeling, um, hopefully with a lot less pain um, than it took me to get to that point. So the way that I've organized the presentation, uh, I've called it a story and five pieces of advice. So I'm gonna give you a quick kind of parable about why we need to get this right. And then I'm gonna go through five areas that I think are the, the kind of key ones um, for where we can uh, make sure that we're doing things, uh, what I think at least is the right way, you know, as of today uh, for applied gravity modeling. Um, as Hannah said, uh, we, we've got this booklet out there. The, the booklet is really aimed at, at uh, practitioners, applied researchers and students. Um, I should say, if you're a PhD student, uh, you, you know, doing an, an advanced level trade course, uh, this booklet is not going to get you through it. It's, it's not a kind of hardcore booklet. There are some equations, um, but it's not at the level of a PhD course. Um, what it will help you do, hopefully, is write a better research paper. Um, so it, it will help students with that. Um, but I think it's most useful for practitioners and applied researchers. That is to say, um, people who are faced all the time uh, with questions that we might try to answer using a gravity model. You can download it. I posted the link in uh, the chat function there through the resources tab of uh, the TPR forum website. Um, and as Hannah said, if you find the booklet useful, if you find the forum useful, um, please do think uh, about helping us out uh, with, a, with a small donation. Um, I should say that we're very happy to take uh, Q&A as we're, as we're going through the presentation. We'll try and organize it uh, as we get into the Q&A session. Um, you can post questions either in Zoom's Q&A function or through the chat function uh, of uh, the, the webinar. Okay, so let me start with my story. And it's a story in two panels. And, you know, when you read the booklet, you'll see that gravity is something that over the years I've become very prescriptive about. So uh, those who know me personally know that I, I can be a little opinionated at times. Um, and this is an area where I tend to be uh, even more opinionated than, uh, than, than average. So I start off with this story, at least in the presentation, that I talk about the wrong way and the right way. And I'm really contrasting the way in which we would have done gravity modeling in the early 2000s with the way that we do it now. And when I talk about doing gravity modeling in the early 2000s, I was doing that. Um, so, you know, I've been doing this for, for over 15 years. And so, you know, I can say with, uh, with, with sort of some degree of, of feeling that when I talk about the wrong way, uh, this is something that I absolutely would have done in the past. Okay. And so I've learned the hard way. Uh, how to get from the left panel to the right panel. So let's talk about the differences between the two panels. So what I've said here is, you know, what if we wanted to use a gravity model to estimate the impact of a US-Japan free trade agreement? Well, in the kind of bad old days, we would have just written down a model. We would have said, you know, Tim Bergen in the 1960s, he wrote something down with something about trade on the left-hand side. Uh, GDP and distance on the right-hand side. So we can just write that model down. We'll log linearize it. We'll estimate by OLS. And, uh, you know, that'll give us an answer. And so uh, when you go through and actually do that uh, with, a, with a current data set, uh, it gives you the result that a US-Japan uh, free trade agreement would increase bilateral trade by about 46%. Um, but it gives you the very inconvenient implication that it would have no impact on, at all on third countries. Now, I say that uh, if you go back through the literature, even from the early 2000s, there were all sorts of tricks that people were using to try and get third country effects. Because, of course, if you've taken a course in international trade, you know that through general equilibrium, there are always third country effects. But in the early 2000s, prior specifically to uh, a famous paper that came out in 2003, um, there was no systematic way of getting third country effects in a theory consistent way into the model. Now, contrast that with the way that we would do it today. Firstly, we'd use multiple years of data, preferably a long uh, time series. 
we'd use a model with a whole bunch of fixed effects. So now when we estimate a gravity model, uh, you don't see GDP in the model, you see fixed effects instead. Often you don't even see distance, you see that replaced with fixed effects as well, yet we still call it gravity because of the theoretical form uh, that it takes. Uh, we'd estimate it different, differently. We wouldn't log linearize and, and use OLS. We'd keep it in nonlinear form and use PPML, the Poisson pseudo maximum likelihood estimator. So what difference does all of this technology make? Well, it divides uh, the size of the effect by about 10. So we go from a massive effect, you, you know, a nearly 50% increase in bilateral trade to uh, about a 5% increase. It's different depending on the direction in which you're going. So the, the effect for the US is different for the effect from Japan. And we see small impacts on third countries, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. So you can start talking about trade creation, trade diversion, uh, all these sorts of things. So that's the story, okay? So we, we've got the kind of old way of doing it. We've got what I think is the current way of doing it. And now I'm gonna take you through five pieces of advice, uh, which as I say, I've mostly learned the hard way um, that will hopefully get you from the left-hand side to the right-hand side in your own work. So if we go through the first piece of advice, the first piece of advice, you know, you can see on the on the slides that, that I, I've done these kind of uh, don'ts and, and do's. I'm not going to go through each bit of it specifically, but the first key point that I'd really like you to take away is to invest a lot of time at the beginning of a research project, figuring out whether or not the question you've got in front of you is one that gravity is really well placed to answer. Now, gravity is a really great flexible framework. It's very extensively used in international trade, but that does not mean that every interesting question in trade gets answered using a gravity model. So be really careful of taking an otherwise interesting question and then trying to shoehorn it into gravity because gravity is the model uh, that you know or the model that you can easily work with. Be open to other approaches. Now, if you know that you wanna use gravity and you're looking around for the right sort of problem um, that will be a good fit, my tip is to focus on policy factors that affect bilateral trade costs. Okay, so, you know, in the standard gravity model, the old one, we, we talk about distance, maybe trade agreements, but of course, there's a whole lot more to trade policy than just that. Uh, there, there are uh, export subsidies, there are uh, restrictions to services trade, there's trade facilitation, there's all these sorts of uh, different policy measures. Um, there are ways of unbundling the effect of a trade agreement, looking at particular aspects of the trade agreement, particular types of trade agreement. So all of these factors affect bilateral trade costs. And the reason that I'm suggesting to focus on them is that they slot really easily into the current uh, theoretical or structural gravity modeling framework. A lot of other trade policy questions don't fit in quite so easily. So first key takeaway, be careful with the match that you get between your research question and uh, the model that you're using. And the second aspect of this is always be clear about what you're doing. Is it an econometric esti uh, estimation exercise? So an exercise where you really want a parameter estimate and that's good enough for you? Or do you have a counterfactual in mind? Uh, if you've got a counterfactual in mind, um, in fact, the econometric estimate is not enough and you need to go an extra step and think about simulation. So again, splitting out these different types of problems and thinking about the right methodology for each one um, is a really great investment at the start of a project. So second piece of advice, um, I'm not a theorist, uh, not by any stretch of the imagination. I do applied work. But if you want to do applied work well and you want to do policy work well, you have to make theory your friend. Now, the reason that I say that is that from this classic paper in 2003 called Gravity with Gravitas, um, theory has been a key part of doing gravity well. And the reason is that it makes really strong implications about the way that the model looks, even the way that you estimate it, the types of fixed effects uh, that you use, and now there are some really beautiful uh, results in the literature and indeed very surprising results in the literature, which show that you have a broad class of gravity models where you can start from all sorts of different assumptions about production technology. Uh, uh, there's a lot of similarity in the way consumption is, is uh, dealt with, but you can start from all these different frameworks 
And if you play the theory out in a particular way, you get to a gravity model that is estimated and simulated in exactly the same way, at least up to some assumptions about what particular parameters mean. So my tip again, make theory your friend, spend some time getting familiar with the theories that lie behind the standard structural gravity uh, class, and then choose to work, I would argue, with this broad class of structural gravity models that all work in basically the same way. Now, the reason that I like doing that as a policy researcher and an applied researcher is that people always ask about robustness, okay? If you start from a theory and you derive a whole bunch of implications, you estimate the model, the question that you always get in a policy setting is, well, what if the theory is wrong? Well, what if the world actually works in a slightly different way? And the beauty of using this class of models is that you can say, well, uh, whether I've got a, a heterogeneous industries world, that is to say a Ricardian world, uh, whether I've got, with some extra assumptions, a heterogeneous firms world, whether I've got a monopolistic competition world, whether I've got a perfect competition world, as long as I set the model up in a particular way, the theoretical assumptions that I start from are actually not determining um, the types of conclusion that I get out of the model. Now, there's all sorts of nuances to that. I go through them uh, a little bit in the booklet, but there's some great work establishing a class of models that will work in the same way. And I think this is a really helpful uh, thing for us as uh, policy researchers. Third key piece of advice. If you're doing econometrics, and you don't always have to do econometrics, but uh, mostly uh, we do do econometrics when we think of gravity. If you do it, do it right. Okay, so a few key implications uh, for this. As I said at the beginning, there is no longer a terribly good argument for log linearizing the model and estimating it by OLS. Okay, typically we're going to keep it uh, in a nonlinear form. That's got a, a whole bunch of advantages uh, that I talk about in the booklet. But uh, a key point is that we should be using an estimator that is consistent under weak assumptions. Now, if you think back to your econometrics classes, when we evaluate the properties of an estimator, we talk about three different types of properties as a sort of starting point. We talk about consistency, we talk about bias, and we talk about efficiency. PPML, I think, is a great estimator because it's consistent under very weak assumptions. Basically, if you get the right variables in the model, PPML will provide consistent estimates, that is to say estimates that converge on the true parameter values as you add more and more data. So it's a large uh, and an infinite uh, property. But uh, provided that you get the variables right, you get the right estimates. Many other competing estimators that are not pseudo maximum likelihood estimators, but different types of maximum likelihood estimators do not have uh, that property. And I go through some of the uh, examples that we have from the literature in the booklet of cases where people have sort of published a result saying, oh, I think I can do better than PPML um, if I make a particular assumption about what the errors look like and then estimate the model uh, using a different maximum likelihood estimator. Well, you know, it is possible to improve on PPML, but for a given set of explanatory variables that are determining uh, bilateral trade, the only margin that you can improve on um, subject to that set of variables is efficiency. And I think as applied researchers, we actually value consistency over efficiency. Efficiency means getting small, uh, the smallest possible standard errors. So that's why I like PPML. Now, the second aspect of getting the econometrics right is that we've got to get the fixed effects right. Now, in the older literature, there's all sorts of things going on. Uh, some people don't use fixed effects at all. Some people use one configuration. Some people use a different configuration. It turns out that theory has very clear implications about what the configuration of fixed effects should be. Single year of data, you need exporter and importer fixed effects. Multiple years of data, you need export a year fixed effects, import a year fixed effects, and probably country pair fixed effects as well. So always use the pattern of fixed effects that is dictated by theory. Again, in some of the uh, slightly older literature, this is now only going back a few years, you'll see people say, well, look, I know what theory says uh, the fixed effects should look like, but actually my computer won't let me estimate a model with so many of them. No longer a constraint. We have great packages in Stata and R. In, in Stata, the package is called PPML HDFE. In R, I use GLM HDFE. You can also use Fixest or you can use Alpaca. Um, but all of these packages allow you to very quickly estimate models 
with tens of thousands of fixed effects in them. Um, so there's basically no computational uh, limit for the types of databases uh, that we're using in Gravity these days. Um, do check those packages out. Again, there's no need to reinvent the wheel on any of this. Don't think that you've got to program your own estimators and start from scratch and all this sort of thing. There are great packages out there. And as applied researchers, we want to make maximum possible use of them. The other thing that I think you should think about when you're doing the econometrics is including domestic shipments. Um, I present a couple of reasons in the booklet uh, as to why I think it's a good idea. Uh, Yoto Yotov, who's one of the kind of leading uh, researchers on gravity at the moment, I just lost my slide, sorry, um, has a paper in which he presents 15 reasons for using uh, domestic shipments. So if you don't believe me, believe Yotov. Um, I use it pretty systematically in my work because for policy research, again, it's got uh, a lot of things that make it easy, for example, to estimate uh, country specific uh, policies. That is to say country uh, policies that work on an MFN basis. If you're doing simulation, then you need to have uh, domestic shipments in the model. So again, have a, have a think about that uh, as you go through uh, your gravity work. All right. That, that's the econometrics. I said sometimes you'll need to do econometrics, but not always. Well, sometimes you'll do econometrics and then you'll also want to do something else. That is to say, think about a counterfactual uh, simulation. I think that as policy people, that is to say practitioners and applied researchers, this is nearly always the most interesting part of gravity for us. If I walk into a policy setting, uh, so if I'm presenting my work to uh, policy professionals, say at, 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 uh, at, at OECD or WTO or one of these other settings, um, they don't want to know what the partial elasticity of bilateral trade with respect to a particular type of trade cost is. They don't know what that means and they don't know why I use the word partial, which I argue in the book that we need to say systematically when we report estimates. Um, it's partial in a very important sense. That is to say that it doesn't take account of the full range of general equilibrium effects that we know are happening. When I go into a policy setting, what people most often want to know is if I change a policy in a particular way, what does the world look like? What do my exports look like? What do my imports look like? What does GDP look like? And that is a counterfactual simulation. Okay, now it turns out that some of the best work on gravity in the last uh, probably five or six years has been done in the area of counterfactual simulation. It's now very easy uh, it takes a single line of state of code to, estimate, to uh, simulate a, a gravity model counterfactual that takes full account of the restrictions imposed by theory and gives you a rich set of counterfactual uh, predictions. Now, why is it important to do counterfactuals in a theory consistent way? Well, if you just write down an old style intuitive gravity model, like I said at the beginning, you don't get any third country effects and your elasticity is a full summary of the effect of a policy change. When you write down the theory, those two statements are no longer true. You have a bunch of third country effects and the estimated parameter in your econometric model is no longer a full and complete summary of the impact of a policy change. So if you're interested in doing this, and I think as policy people, we should all be interested in doing it, check out a package called GE Gravity. Um, it's available both in Stata and R, and like I say, it enables you to do this uh, in basically a single line of uh, Stata code. Um, having said that, when you do a counterfactual simulation, as with any simulation, you've got to be really careful when you're reporting it to talk about what the assumptions and limits are, and indeed to talk about exactly what a counterfactual means. That is to say, we change one policy factor and assume that everything else remains constant. It's a way of thinking about the world that's very familiar to economists, but in my experience, it requires a very clear explanation in policy settings. Okay, so all of that was based on what I call in the booklet, the standard uh, structural gravity model. That is to say this family of gravity models that all behave in much the same way for estimation and simulation. Now, of course, uh, the standard framework is fantastic. I use it a lot. Um, there are lots of ways to build on it. And I talk about that in the last section of the booklet by looking at some extensions to the standard framework. Now, the key piece of advice is that if you want to extend the standard framework, um, make sure to do it in a way that respects theory. 
Um, so that means that you're either a theorist yourself, um, in which case you can just start from scratch and develop uh, your own structural model, or you're going to make use of some of the excellent theory that is already out there. And there are some fantastic contributions looking at uh, multi-sector models with input-output linkages. That's actually the, the version that I'm using uh, most commonly these days. There are dynamic models uh, looking at how changes take place over time. Um, there are models with unemployment, there are models with comparative advantage, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the cost of getting into these uh, extensions is a little higher than for the standard structural gravity model. That is to say, you're gonna to need to get hold of replication data and code and do a little work yourself uh, to get up to speed. But if these are areas that interest you, that is to say, multi-sector models, dynamic effects, unemployment, comparative advantage, these sorts of things, uh, researchers tend to be very good at posting uh, uh, replication code. You can download it, work with it, and learn how to do it uh, yourself. So, that's basically my five pieces of advice. So we started with a parable. These are the big picture pieces of advice. If you want more detail, um, do have a look at uh, the, the booklet. Um, as Hannah said, it's available through tprforum.org on the resources tab. I put that in the chat earlier. Um, we would invite you to keep up to date uh, with what we're doing. We have a webinar about once a month. You can join our mailing list. I'll put that link uh, in the chat as well. Um, and of course, we welcome your feedback. We hope that this will be uh, the first in a series of little publications that we do as part of TPRF aimed at uh, policy practitioners and people coming to trade policy from a variety of different backgrounds. We want them to be accessible um, and above all, we want them to be used. Um, so if it's something that you find uh, useful and helpful, or if you think there's a way we could improve it, uh, please do let us know. And with that, uh, looking very forward to continuing the discussion in uh, Q&A. Thank you so very much for that, um, Ben. I think this is a um, spectacular webinar and it's a fantastic booklet. Uh, and by doing all this work, because there is a lot of work behind, uh, behind it, um, you are taking the forum to a brand new level. Um, and uh, you have in 60 pages, you know, just carefully but generously walked us through absolutely everything we need to know. You call it a crash course, but I would say that it is, uh, you know, we didn't crash at all. It was smooth sailing. Um, and so thank you so very, very much for that. Um, I am going to hand it over immediately uh, to Sylvia because Sylvia has been um, helping out along the way and also work with these issues every day at the OECD. Uh, so why don't you take it first, Sylvia, and people just have your questions, come, come on in, um, just post them and we will get to as many of them as possible. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah, and um, good day to, to everyone uh, listening in today and, and hello to many colleagues and, and friends I see among participants as well. And of course, thank you to, uh, to Ben for um, the presentation and, um, and putting up the, the booklet as well as for the opportunity to have a few words of, of discussion today. It also reminds me that I think it was a year ago where, where we're having another TPR uh, for, for webinar uh, on, on trade facilitation. So so it's like a one year anniversary of, of being a discussant in, in that webinar back then. And it's a great opportunity to, to do that again um, today on the, um, on the Gravity booklet. Well, I think that obviously as a practitioner in, uh, in the policy analysis world, uh, having a booklet uh, written in, in the style that, that Ben has is extremely uh, useful and, and a guiding tool for sort of having a compass on, on some of the key issues that as, as Ben was mentioning, we kind of deal with every day. We made mistakes along the way um, and, and that we need to, to keep in mind when, when doing this kind of um, analysis. But also I think it's a very good uh, tool in learning how to read and understand um, the, the related literature and then stay up to date with, with the developments, which again, you may not always have the time to, uh, to be up to date with, uh, with the most recent developments in this area. So it's really a good, a good tool to, to have as well in, um, in this sense as, um, 
you do work on gravity uh, along the way. Um, and I think that the, the basically this, the three areas that, that the booklet mentions that as its objectives are also uh, sort of the big three reasons for, for myself uh, and then I guess for other policy analysts or students, uh, early career researchers to, to use uh, such, such a guideline in, uh, in gravity modeling. So how to set up a gravity model. Um, and I think that the booklet provides this very useful framework on the push, pull and drag factors, which, which I personally found, found very useful. Um, then of course, how to estimate the, the gravity model. And then we have here some very good tips uh, that come on the how from, from the latest literature, but also how to avoid some of the, the traps is, as we we're mentioning there, there have been quite a few uh, in, in the past decades while, while we we're trying to do gravity. And, and also, again, from a practitioner in the policy uh, analysis space, how to interpret the results from, from the specification. And then I think Ben was mentioning that, uh, you know, it's sometimes not always straightforward to pull that result out of the gravity and then make the interpretation um, less, the less technical possible for, for policymakers while also taking all the caveats uh, that need to be taken in, into account. So that's something that um, I personally deal, deal with a lot. So, so it's really useful again to, to have the tools um, in this space to, to deal with this, uh, with these kind of details. Um, so having said that, I think, yeah, again, it's, um, it's written in such a way that, that really allows you to demystify some of the, the things along the way that we may have not been doing in the right way, but also pick up the, the most recent developments. And in this sense, you know, before kicking off with, um, with more of the questions that are coming through through the chat, I guess one, one of the questions that um, stood in my mind and for, for Ben, you know, in terms of the, the mod, the specifying the model and, and having the specification, I think you're talking a lot about the focus on the bilateral trade costs, but basically what would be your advice on, on the, the identification of, of these country level policy variables and then how best to, uh, to take them into account, you know, with with the new developments, of course, on um, on the data on, on domestic shipments, I think this is something that uh, could could be quite of interest for for others. And I was already seeing um, a very interesting question coming through the chat. And, and again, I, I guess it deals with um, with putting the setting out for for gravity modeling is in terms of how the gravity model basically today can help answer questions relating to to global value chains and then how maybe the, the literature has been involving. In, in this space to um, to address some of the questions that um, that link to to GVCs. So I guess as as we take maybe other questions through through the chat, maybe we can have you Ben start with with these. Sure. Th thanks, Sylvia, and and you know thanks to both Sylvia and Hannah for the for, for the kind words about the booklet, and thanks to everyone uh, for the for, for the questions and and comments in uh, Q and A. Um, Gee, where, where to start? There's, there's, there's a lot of material. So let, let me take the GBC question uh, first. So, uh, you know, the short answer is, is that the standard uh, structural gravity model that I was talking about in the presentation is a single sector model. Um, so does it speak directly to GBCs? Not really. Um, you can estimate it separately for intermediate and final goods trade, and that might tell you something interesting with differences in elasticities. But if you want to work on GVCs, you're probably more interested in looking at a multi-sector model with input-output linkages. Um, so the model that I use these days, I'll, I'll put uh, the, this paper into the chat, but I use a version of uh, the model by Caliendo and Paro, which is a multi-sector Ricardian model. Um, trade is governed by uh, a, a gravity model that looks exactly like uh, the class of gravity models uh, that I've mentioned when you estimate it econometrically. But the counterfactual simulation is very different. And in fact, I've, I've got a paper uh, just going through the works at, at the moment um, where we talk about uh, how to use this to, uh, to speak very directly to the GVC impacts of a trade policy change. So you can actually do a breakdown of trade into GVC and non-GVC components, both before and after the shock. And so it can tell you very directly uh, what the implications are for GVCs. Um, so that's the tip, think about a multi-sector model. Um, the trap is to take the standard uh, structural gravity model and stick some measure of trade and value added on the left-hand side. Seems very attractive, 
but I'm calling it a trap because in fact, you're departing from theory in very important ways uh, when you do that. So you, you, it, it is worth having a bit of a, a kind of a rethink um, about how you, how you go through it. Now, uh, the second question that you had there, Sylvia, was about uh, country level policies. So these are policies that are specific to a country, but don't vary by partner. So how do you fit those into my advice to kind of focus on uh, bilateral trade costs? Well, of course, some of those do impact bilateral trade costs. So in terms of the general picture, you know, something like trade facilitation, which you and I both work on, uh, it's a classic factor that, it, that, uh, that affects trade costs, but we measure it on a country specific basis and not a bilateral basis. So how do we get that into the model? Um, the simplest answer is to include domestic shipments in the model. And then by interacting our measure of trade facilitation or a country level policy with a dummy for uh, international shipments because trade facilitation affects international but not domestic shipments, we can identify the effect. And so in fact, that's what I've uh, done in my most recent work on trade facilitation. Um, and it's one of the reasons that, uh, that, that Yoto gives in his kind of uh, 15 reasons to use domestic uh, shipments. I should say that after I finished uh, the booklet, uh, I saw a, a, new, a very new paper that's come out. It's a Bank of England uh, research paper by Yoto Yotov, uh, Rebecca Freeman and, uh, and, and co-authors. Um, and they actually use a slightly different approach uh, to identifying country level policies. If uh, memory serves, you still need domestic shipments, but they use a two stage uh, estimating approach. So I think that's also a very interesting one um, that people might wanna look at. Something that's come up in the chat, uh, two related questions. You know, I've said, focus on using a global data set. Okay, don't just use a single country data set, try to get data on as many countries as possible. And then I've said, try and include domestic shipments. And people have said, hang on, it's hard to put together a global data set. And where do I get domestic shipments? So let me answer those two questions together. Uh, when I'm doing gravity modeling these days, I nearly always use data from a multi-region input output table. Um, for many of the countries that we're talking about, so there, there was a question, uh, I, I can see from the, the, the identity of the person who asked it that the question was coming from India. If we take a country like India, uh, it's represented in a number of the multi-region input output tables uh, that are available. It's in the Asian Development Bank tables, it's in the OECD table, table and it's also in uh, the EORA table. So you can use any of those uh, to construct very easily both a global data set and also a data set that includes uh, domestic shipments. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Um, someone else has mentioned, a couple of people have mentioned the US ITC uh, data set, which is called ITPDE. I think it's a great initiative um, and I, I'm very excited uh, to see them develop this in, in the future. What they've tried to do is uh, to have a more disaggregated uh, uh, approach to domestic shipments. Um, so it gives you data at a slightly more, uh, at a, actually a significantly more disaggregated level than the multi-region uh, input output tables. Um, I've had some troubles working with it because at least for the stuff that I was interested in, there was some missing data uh, that was causing problems uh, for me. Uh, and indeed someone's just mentioned that uh, in, in the chat, um, but that's also a source that you can look at. So in the booklet, um, I go through some of these uh, data sources and uh, give you the references and talk about how you can, uh, how you can find that. Um, maybe I can hand back to Sylvia and Hannah to- Yeah, I was, I was just gonna jump in here because we have a record crowd here today and everyone is super psyched about this as you know, am I, but maybe not everyone has had time to read the paper beforehand. So I'm just gonna slow down the FOMO a little bit here uh, and say that Ben has got you covered. So I've posted the link to the website where you can find the booklet. And in the booklet, there are uh, all these um, there's everything that you need to know to get started. There's important references. There's the history and evolution of how it came about. There are the theoretical underpinnings. Um, there are um, best and worst practices. Uh, there are data sources and even where you know how the code look what it, what the code looks like and where you can find it. So. Uh, and so it's like if he had, if this was a cooking show, he not only would cook for you or you know show you how to do it, but he would cook it, and, and he'd have rules of origin on every part of um, you know whatever ingredient there was 
he would also give you a conversation chart for um, for the conversation on the date that you might have been cooking for. Uh, and there's a cheat sheet. Uh, so there's plenty of stuff going on. And we also have set up a little forum over on the website. If you hang a, head over to the website, there's a new tab on called the forum where you can continue to post questions so that we will uh, try to get as much in uh, here as possible. Um, Sylvia, do you wanna? I saw a particular interesting question. I think it would be of interest for, for a few people, including myself, to, to hear what Ben has to say on um, the use of um, monthly trade data in, uh, in, in a gravity analysis versus the usual um, annual data. And then maybe if I could add another one um, here, um, also again from, from going through through the booklet, you explain, I think, very well, Ben, um, the need to use the, um, the value of exports as, as dependent variable or the share um, at most when, when using PPML. Um, but I'm, I'm just thinking like if, if one would want to see, you know, price versus quantity effects, like we, we may want to attempt in, for instance, analysis on, on NTMs issues, what, what would you advise um, in, in that sense in terms of the specification? So, so I guess around these, <laughs> these two questions. Yeah, sure. Let me let me take the the NTM question first because I I think that's uh, that that that's in, indeed a tough one. So if you go back through the the literature, and this is something I, I've had to deal with uh, personally, you'll see people estimating uh, gravity like models for prices and quantities uh, separately. Whereas I argue in the booklet that when we derive the model from theory, uh, it's actually about value, so price multiplied by uh, quantity. So uh, why would you do it a bit differently uh, for NTMs or why would people want to do it differently? Well, the reason simply is that given the NTM data that we have, we think that there might be different effects on prices and quantities. So that, that is to say some NTMs can uh, increase the price of traded goods. So for instance, a quality uh, measure by taking the quality of the goods up, it takes price up, um, it may decrease quantity. So it has an ambiguous effect on value, but it might even uh, increase uh, overall trade value but it could still be sort of trade restrictive because there's a quantity effect. So wanting to tease these two things out is uh, part of the reason why people do this. Now, having said that, I, I understand the reason, but I'm very skeptical of the approach. Um, if you take theory seriously and you write down your gravity model in value terms, I mean, if you divide through by either prices or quantities, you get all sorts of uh, weird terms on uh, the right-hand side of the equation with things that you can't observe uh, terribly easily. So my advice, um, if you're looking at NTMs in particular and you want to distinguish price and quantity effects is actually to go uh, some steps back in the theory. So when you're deriving a gravity model, there are intermediate steps where you can obtain um, expressions for prices and quantities uh, separately. And so I think that's where you want to, where, where you actually need to go um, in terms of finding um, a, a model to, uh, to estimate. Um, just picking out a couple of the other uh, questions that are that are going through here, there, there was one about uh, zeros, missing values, uh, all, all those sorts of things. Um, you know, my take is that when we've got missing values, um, it can actually be a little problematic to replace them systematically with zeros. There, there's an argument for doing that, um, but the question that was in the, the Q and A was about ITPDE. And there's a particular issue with some of the missing data in ITPDE, which is that it's for domestic production. And I don't believe that, you know, when you see this series uh, that, that's got non-zero values for 2000 through to 2014, and then it becomes missing, I don't think it changes to zero. So um, I would exercise care with that and consider using different data sets. The multi-region IO tables um, typically don't have a lot of zeros in them because they're very uh, aggregate. And by definition, they don't have any missing data uh, whatsoever. On monthly data, my question, so you know, you're, you're right to flag that we do need to be careful uh, using monthly data. Um, in principle, we can estimate the model in the same way. Um, so where I was talking about export a year fixed effects and import a year fixed effects, um, they simply become export a month fixed effects and import a month fixed effects. So there's a lot of fixed effects in the model. Um, it's going to take PPML, HDFE a little while to kind of crank through the solution, um, but it's still just one line of code. And, uh, you know, assuming that it's a, 
you know, not a ridiculously uh, enormous database. You should still be able to do it on a, a regular uh, desktop computer. My question would be, why are you doing it? Okay, if we, if we think about the rationale for running the model in the first place, if you follow, you know, the, the advice that, that I try to follow myself and focus on factors that affect uh, bilateral trade costs, are you observing changes in bilateral trade costs at a monthly level? Maybe you are, um, but for most of the variables we're interested in, you actually don't. So tariffs, NTMs, trade facilitation, um, you're lucky if you even observe these things every year, let alone every month. So if you've got data that is only changing every year and you estimate a monthly model, then you've got a big problem, but it's a clustering problem. Because you've got correlation among the errors, uh, with many months uh, within a year, you've got this kind of classic uh, Moulton style uh, clustering problem. So you need to be very careful with your clustering. Um, but of course, the way to fix that is to avoid the problem entirely and estimate the model at the level of frequency that is implied by your variable of interest. So if you observe the variable of interest once a year, estimate a yearly model. Again, if you've got some piece of data that changes monthly, uh, lucky you. Um, you, you can enjoy it. You should be able to estimate the model uh, without too much trouble, subject, of course, to some of the time series properties uh, that may be in the data. Um, let, me, let me hand back, what, what else should we uh, cycle through? Well, maybe in follow-up to that uh, around data, I think there's another interesting question that um, is looking to know how, how to use the gravity model with firm level data. So I guess if, if you have any, any views on that one, and another interesting question, maybe if I could just add uh, this one as well, I think is asking regarding your contribution to the Arvis and Shepard paper 2013, which I, I would think is the one around trade costs. So it was actually leading me to, to ask you, how, how do you, also, if you could tell us a little bit maybe on, um, on deriving trade costs from, from the gravity model. Sure. Uh, so let me take them in order. Uh, we, with a firm level model, uh, I mean, there we're really in the space of sort of gravity like uh, models. So if you start from a heterogeneous firms framework, um, basically you're leaving out the last aggregation stage of the model. That is to say, where you sum over all firms to get expressions like expenditure and all these sorts of things that uh, typically go into gravity. Um, I actually haven't. Uh, I mean, I, I don't have access, you know, as a, as a private uh, person, I don't have access to uh, national firm level data sets. Um, if you look at some of the work that's been done in particular with the French data, so thinking of Lionel Fontanier's uh, papers, there are some nice ones on uh, 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 technical barriers to trade, for example, then they, they have a framework that, that's kind of pretty close to, to gravity. And, you know, you can start from a similar theoretical uh, framework and get to the sort of estimating uh, expressions that they use. But you know, when I'm talking about the standard uh, structural gravity model, then it's to be applied to trade flows. That, that is to say aggregate uh, trade flows in value terms, exports from one country uh, to another. So uh, I, I would just sort of you know, be a little uh, cautious uh, about that. Then uh, the, the PPML question, so the, the 2013 uh, paper that someone's been well, wow, I'm impressed that someone's read the paper. I didn't know anyone actually had, but uh, th thanks for the, the shout out. Um, this is actually a, a different paper uh, from the trade cost one, but I'll, I'll mention that in, in a second. It's a technical paper about the properties of PPML. Um, basically what we do very badly and what uh, Thibault Fayy does in a 2015 paper very, very clearly and much, much better is to show that if you run a structural gravity model, if you estimate it using PPML, then you get an exact correspondence between the unobservables implied by theory, that is to say uh, output or expenditure divided by a price index and the fixed effects in the gravity model. It's a remarkable result. And uh, I believe it is only true for PPML within the class of uh, generalized linear models. So, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty prescriptive in the booklet about using PPML. Um, there are many reasons for liking PPML. Uh, one is that it's robust to heteroscedasticity. 
Another is that it includes uh, zeros in the estimation sample. But I think one that's actually a little bit underrated in uh, some of the literature proposing alternatives is uh, that it gives you measures that are absolutely consistent with theory. So you can take the fixed effects and actually calculate inward and outward multilateral resistance. That is to say the price indices implied by uh, the gravity with gravitas uh, paper. So that's kind of a neat property. As I say, we, we talk about that in a kind of very indirect wishy-washy uh, way. And uh, Thibault in, in his 2015 paper does it uh, much, much better. Then uh, trade costs. So, uh, you know, that's some other work that, that, uh, that we've done. I actually haven't gone, gone through this in, uh, in the booklet, but it is possible to rearrange the gravity model to learn something about trade costs. Um, so there's a paper that I've used a lot uh, by Dennis Novi, and I, I know Sylvia, you've uh, used it as well. Um, so the World Bank and UNESCAP put together a, a data set of uh, trade costs uh, using uh, an, an inversion of the gravity model. And there's actually a really nice paper um, by Peter Egger and co-authors uh, for the World Trade Organization. Uh, they, they finished it or they got close to finishing it in 2018, but it only came out uh, last year. And that's got a really, really nice way of using structural gravity to estimate trade costs uh, without actually having to observe anything. It's a, it's a really neat uh, piece of, of econometrics that they do. And so then the WTO uses that as the basis for their new uh, trade cost index. So if, if you're interested in, in that work, um, you know, I've, I've got uh, stuff on it. Uh, World Bank UNESCAP uh, has work on it, but, but I think the, uh, the, the best stuff as of today is this Peter Egger paper, which you can download uh, from the WTO website. Um, so do, do we have time for one or two more? Oh, let Sorry, me my, the, 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 there's an yeah, interesting we have, one here. We have, you have a few more questions, a, a few more minutes. Sorry, Ben, having networked. Yeah, let me, uh, there's one that I like here about uh, sample selection. So the, the Heckman estimator, because it opens up kind of a whole uh, class of questions about, you know, can I just kind of always use PPML or are there situations in which another estimator is going to be uh, better? So for the Heckman estimator, there's uh, a paper, a 2008 paper by, uh, you know, leading, uh, leading lights, Helpman, Mellitz, Rubenstein, where they use a sample selection model because of zeros in gravity and they've got a particular selection mechanism um, that, that's going on. Now, the key question is um, in the data, uh, do we have a situation where PPML has got the right set of explanatory variables or not? The reason that I'm framing the question that way is that when you have a selection effect going on, so in the heterogeneous firms literature, if you observe firms uh, self-selecting into export status, um, it can create a kind of cutoff in the trade values uh, that, that you see. So Helpman, Mellitz, Rubenstein deal with that uh, through, uh, through the, the, the Heckman sample selection uh, estimator. There are other suggestions in the literature that there may be other, uh, so for example, some version of the Tobit estimator. There are suggestions that that may be uh, a better way of proceeding. But the question is always whether or not there is a variable that's missing from PPML. If there is a variable missing, um, then the estimates are not going to be consistent, quite simply because you've got the wrong uh, variables in the model. Uh, it's not really something about Poisson, it's a, it's a question of data at that point. So can you try and fix it with another estimator? Be very cautious with this. You can find a lot of papers, uh, particularly from the early days of PPML, that is to say from you know, about 2006 through to 2010, where people say, oh, look, I've improved on PPML and they give you a simulation showing that they've improved on it. In my experience, a lot of those papers sacrifice consistency for efficiency. They make a very strict assumption on how the data is generated and then say, oh, look, if I use an estimator where exactly that assumption holds, I get better answers. And, you know, of course you do. But the question is, how can we know that that process actually holds in the data? So here's where it's good to have a really detailed reading of the literature. Uh, Santos Silva and Tenreiro, who wrote the original PPML paper called The Log of Gravity, they have a couple of tests uh, in that paper itself. And then they have another paper looking specifically at Heckman, uh, where they provide diagnostic tests uh, that are very easy to run, where you can actually see uh, how well uh, the data might fit some other model. 
In the log of gravity, they're looking at it against OLS. In uh, this other uh, model, uh, 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 th th this other paper, a later paper, they're looking at it specifically against Heckman. The question was about Heckman. Um, if you're interested in that, check out a stator command called HPC. Um, it, it's the HPC test, which comes from this uh, Santos Silva Tanrero paper. And that will hopefully tell you their, their experience when they run the test is that generally PPML is the model that you would pick even when you've got a ton of zeros uh, in, in the data. Uh, let me just scroll down and see what else we've got. Uh, so there was a question, maybe I'll take this, this last one about migration and uh, remittances. So yeah, there, there's a ton of uh, literature looking at other mo instances of bilateral flows and, and sort of saying, you know, can we estimate something interesting about those using gravity? My answer in that case is go back to theory. Basically, you're going to start from a different set of assumptions. Potentially, it's going to be some, some assumption about the movement of people or the way in which people send money uh, across borders and you're then going to derive some sort of model of that uh, bilateral flow. Uh, will it look something like gravity? Uh, in many cases it's, uh, it probably will, but I wouldn't take a standard structural gravity model from the trade framework, which is about value of trade, so value of exports, and say, well my model for migration or remittances is just going to be exactly the same. So again, make theory your friend, have a look around in the literature, um, or you know, do your own theory and actually derive it uh, rigorously. I think that's taken us about as far through the questions as we yeah. can get. Yeah, I see Lars Nilsson in, in the audience is Swedish too, and he knows uh, underbar.com, which is wonderful, is short, boring lasts a long time. And a wonderful is short and was short today. So thank you so much, Ben, for this. Uh, and for all of those who are now reading the paper and reading up on the paper and listening to all these amazing questions, you can, we will continue the, these conversations um, in very many ways, actually. There's a new thing on the website under forum where you can continue the conversation with and post questions for Ben and Sylvia. I saw um, Dennis Novi is actually going to be um, who's on the references is, is going to be a guest later on this uh, spring with us. Um, as always, we are looking, if there's any particular topic or any particular speaker that you would like to have on the forum, let us know. We have some amazing new features coming up and people um, and ideas that we're running with here. And so we are thrilled to um, share them with you. That will probably come up in the February webinar. Uh, so we'll be back by the end of February. For now, please make sure that you do sign up for the what do we call it um, newsletter? So um, Ben, where so that we don't miss because we are on we are on Twitter, we are on LinkedIn. But um, thank you, Leslie. It was amazing, right? Good thing I bothered him for a whole year. It was worth it. Um, uh, so so that you so that you don't miss out on what's going on. Uh, we will post this webinar and Ben's slides on the website. And thank you so much for considering to donate um, so that we can keep this going. Uh, thank you so much, Ben. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Thank you so much, everyone who was here with amazing questions. Uh, and we'll catch you again soon. Th thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Sylvia. And thanks, everyone, uh, for attending and for the fantastic questions. I really appreciate it. Excellent. Have a great day. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.